Thank you, Bill. I'm going to have to move this down. <coughs> we often, I think, as, as uh, scholars think that science progresses in a very logical way, with scholars pursuing a specific question and following a specific protocol to arrive at a clear answer. My own research um, actually shows a very different reality where chance bits of fortune led me to the conclusion that there was cacao in Chaco Canyon. So today I wanted to concentrate on the serendipitous way that we discovered cacao in Chaco Canyon. Um, there were actually six serendipitous events. Each of them will be highlighted by a red slide, so when I get to the red slides, you'll be surprised um, and know that something big is going on. And the serendipitous events, not to give you any hints, but they are the following. <laughs> Dirty ceramics. Poor lighting, I opened the wrong drawer, I ask a silly question, the Air Force has a base in Albuquerque, and I married the right man. <laughs> Too bad he's not here today. We just had our 20th anniversary on Wednesday. So, anyway, okay. So I'm going to begin uh, today by talking about the um, cylinder jars of Chaco Canyon, what they are, how we found cacao and believe it's related to the cylinder jars, where cacao comes from and why people might want to import it, and then what the implications are for Chaco Canyon. And I've given various versions of this talk, some as long as two hours, so tonight, I, or this afternoon, I'm giving the Reader's Digest version. It'll be pretty fast, um, but you can always ask me questions later. Okay, so here we are in Chaco. We're at the end of the big red arrow. You, you see that if you fly over New Mexico, that giant red arrow pointing at Chaco Canyon. Um, it is located in northwestern New Mexico, and the time period that we're interested in today is A.D. 1000 to 1125. Now, I started studying Chaco and cylinder jars in about 2002 or 2003, somewhere in there. And at that time, my primary question was, how were they used? Why did they make this specific vessel form, and how were they used? Cylinder jars are, by definition, about twice as tall as they are wide. They average about 10 inches high and about 4 inches wide. They often have small lug handles, which are uh, these things here and there. This one doesn't. Um, they come in three varieties. The all red variety you see here, which uh, has shirred temper and I'm pretty sure is from the Mogollon area. The, what is called all white and then the black and white. And these are the percentages of each. There are only four of these all red cylinder jars. Um, when decorated, the designs vary, but most often they are some variation on this theme, all hatched. Um, but you do get all solid or, or a combination of solid and hatched, but generally they look like this. Um, the designs and the context in which they're found indicate that they were made and probably used between about A.D. 1000 and 1125 to 1150, somewhere in there. Now, when I started this research, there were four ideas about how cylinder jars were used. Um, the first of these came from Dorothy Washburn, who studied all of the cylinder jars as well, and she noted that some of them had deep scratches on the inside and um, sh bits of shell and turquoise in them. And she believed that they were used for storing high value items like shell and turquoise and obsidian. And that as you took these items in and out of the cylinder jars, they would scratch the side. So you would get this deeply scratched interior on them. The second explanation came from Steve Lexon who used a, an analogy with the Navajo, 
who make ceramic drums. They take ceramic jars and they tie skins onto them. They can put varying amounts of water inside the jars and then use them as drums and the water makes varied sounds. Um, Steve Lexon thought that the, the cylinder jars might have been used in the same way, that the lug handles might have been used for tying the hides onto the jars and that each individual would have their own cylinder jar drum. So that was his explanation. And then the third explanation came from Wolke Toll, who argued he also has studied all the cylinder jars, and he argued that they were primarily used for ritual and that they were stored in community houses in between uses. He didn't have a very specific use for them, but generally he felt that they were used in some kind of ritual and then placed into community houses for storage in between. The fourth explanation comes from Laurie Pendleton of the American Museum of Natural History, who argued that they were pressure cookers for parrots. <laughs> <coughs> So these are mostly reasonable explanations. <laughs> and the thing about Lori's explanation that's so fabulous is that it too would explain the deep gouges on the inside <laughs> of the jars. Those poor little parrots trying desperately to get out before they're cooked. And no, Lori is not serious about this. I, I have to tell you, people always say, well, is she really serious? No, she's not serious. But I think it's a really good idea. OK, so how do archaeologists go about looking at how something is used? Generally, we do that by looking at multiple lines of evidence. We look at the context in which things are found. So we look at where the cylinder jars are found. We look at use wear to see what types of wear was on the jars and what that might show about their use. We look at analogy, how similar vessels found in other parts of the New World were used and how, you know, whether we can adopt those same uses or not. And we look at residues, the types of residues found on them. And then we can put all of that together, the context, the use where, the residues, and analogy, to try to come up with an explanation for how something was used. So in the case of the cylinder jars, I tried to run through all of these possible lines of evidence to see how they might have been used. And first we look at where they occur. Um, there are about 187 known examples, although I'm starting to find more and more in, that, are, that are broken and in trash, so I think that number is actually going to go up quite a bit. But of the whole ones in museums, it's about 187. All but six of these come from Chaco Canyon, so they're very localized within the canyon. And of those, 166 come from Pueblo Benito. So almost all of them from a single site. And then of those, 102 come from a single large cache in room 28 at Pueblo Benito. So in other words, 89% of all of the known whole cylinder jars come from a single site. And when we look at the distribution of them, oh, here's Pueblo Benito. If you, how many of you have been there to Pueblo Benito? So, most of you have been out there and have seen, seen where it is and what it looks like. Um, if we look at the distribution of them, this is what the distribution looks like. Those are all the rooms that had at least one cylinder jar in them. And remember that a lot of rooms in Pueblo Benito have been excavated. The vast majority of rooms have been excavated. So we've got a very good sample of excavated context there. And what we find is that um, it appears that they're pretty well distributed, but in fact, there's a, a large cluster of them on the north side of the site here, and then a, sec a second cluster on the west side. These remaining rooms mostly just have one cylinder jar in them, so there aren't very many from those rooms. Room 28, the room that has the large cache, is right here. It's just adjacent to the plaza area of Pueblo Benito. And it's a pretty unassuming room otherwise. This is what it looked like when it was excavated in the 1890s by the Hyde Exploring Expedition under the uh, supervision of George Pepper and Richard Wetherill. And they found um, 
initially they found, they started coming down on this layer of pottery, and so what they did was to cover the pots with sheepskins and then excavate the rest of the room. And then they uncovered all of the, this top layer of the cylinder jars and took some really wonderful photos of them. This is what they call the bird's eye view. They had their photographer hanging um, over a, um, a plank across the room. And uh, this was the first layer of the cylinder jars. In addition to the cylinder jars in the room, they also found a lot of what are called pot lids. Uh, they're sandstone discs that might have served as pot lids or maybe as um, coasters to keep rings off the furniture. <laughs> um, and they're just about exactly as many um, sandstone discs or pot lids as there are cylinder jars. So those two things might be related to one another. Okay, so he, he excavated this, photographed it, took this out, all these pots out, and then he found another layer under that. He numbered them, took photographs, took them out, and he kept going until he actually had found five separate layers of cylinder jars. There are also some bowls and pitchers mixed in there. Um, and he, by the end, he actually was digging under this wall of dirt, which is holding up this masonry wall, which is holding up all of this sandstone and debris up here. So it was getting pretty dangerous by the time he got down to layer five there and had uncovered all of that. Okay, so basically to answer the first question, what we can say about context for the cylinder jars is that most of them are found in caches. And that's not the only cache. There are other caches within Pueblo Benito, but that's the biggest one. Very few of them are found in rooms with burials. Um, uh, but the ones that are, are not associated with a specific body. They're in the same room, but they're not, they don't seem to be right next to the body or in the grave associated with the body. So we don't think that they're associated with any specific individual. Um, they almost certainly were used for ritual of some kind, but apparently not burial ritual. And because of this distribution within rooms that don't have burials and away from individual burials, we think that they probably belong to the community as a whole or to societies within the community rather than to any single individuals within um, Pueblo Benito. Okay, now we come to oops, serendipity number one, which is dirty ceramics. Now, when Pepper and Wetherill excavated at Pueblo Benito, they shipped by rail car all of the artifacts, or most of them, back to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And when I went there to study them, one of the first things I noticed was that they had never washed their ceramics. And it was wonderful because there actually were patterns of dirt on the ceramics, of residues, of useware that had not been created in the laboratory or washed away in the laboratory. They were right there where we could see them um, and analyze them. And that was really a wonderful thing. It's one of the best things about that collection is that serendipitously, they never clean their ceramics. And what that means for me is that when I see use wear and residues on the American Museum collection, I know that it's original. It's not created by brushes or by anything else. It is the original use wear, and all the mud on them is the original mud that was on them. So that's very, very useful. The other thing that was useful at the American Museum was that the lighting was really poor. Uh, oddly enough, that turned out to be a wonderful thing for me because I began to notice abrasion on the vessels in this poor light. I began to see little scratches not made by macaws being cooked, <laughs> but little scratches on the exterior of the cylinder jars, scratches that run generally up and down the vessel. Um, the vessels, and they're particularly common on what are called the all-white vessels. 
What I began to think was that, in trying to think of how this could be caused, since I knew it wasn't caused by cleaning them in historic times, I began to think it might be caused by cleaning them in pre-Hispanic times, that they were using um, maybe wet sand or something, maybe pieces of sandstone abraders to rub off or scrub off something from the vessels. And the question was, what was that something that they were scrubbing off? Well, about that same time, I also noticed in the poor light with the dirty ceramics that there were these little bits of plaster on some of them. And this, this one is decorated. It's kind of hard to tell because it's very burned. But this is a black and white jar that has this little scrap of plaster on it. Um, but most of the ones with plaster are not decorated. They are the all white vessels. And I wondered, you know, well, why would you put plaster on a vessel? What would be the point of that? Um, and I began to believe, as a hypothesis, I began to think that perhaps what was happening here was that with the all white vessels, they were putting plaster on them and then they were decorating them with what are called post firing pigments. Now, in the Southwest, if you're going to decorate a pot, you can get three basic colors on it. You can get black, you can get white, and you can get shades of red uh, that vary from almost yellow up to a really dark uh, reddish brown. Uh, but what you can't get are greens and blues, especially. Now, these are very important ritual colors among uh, historic groups in the Southwest, and presumably people would like to have these colors if they could. But there is not a way to apply those colors to ceramics and then fire them and have blue and green remain blue and green. It doesn't work. So if you're going to make your vessel blue and green, it has to be applied as a post-firing pigment. That is, put on the vessel after you're, you're done firing it, and then it's fugitive. It can always come off. Um, but I began to wonder if the scraps of plaster weren't there so the designs could be applied to these vessels as post-firing decorations, perhaps using very bright colors. Um, well then, I opened the wrong drawer. I was at the Smithsonian where, um, I know Barbara's been there, uh, probably several of you have been there in their storage facility in Suitland, Maryland. Um, they, the storage facility was completed about, I don't know, it must be about 15 years ago now. And they had the cabinets made by a small business that I think was in Ohio. And they were in such a hurry that they didn't cure the cabinets very well. So they smell like duco cement. And they have the same reaction for people who are there. So when you go in and work in those collections, you either get massive headaches or you start laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> and every time I've been there with a research assistant, luckily, we're both of the laughing uproariously type, so that by the end of the research visit, every pot we see is the funniest pot ever <laughs> created. We just think those are so uproariously funny. Well, this particular research trip, they gave me keys to the cabinets. I don't know what possessed them, but they just gave me a key and said, go sniff the cabinets and do whatever you want to do. Uh, so I was going through the Chaco cabinets, and I opened the wrong drawer, and this is what I found. Uh, this is a black and white shirt from Pueblo Benito that has plaster on it and then turquoise pigment. It's a bowl. Um, but what it told me was that this idea that they might plaster the vessels and then put post-firing pigments on them might not be completely out of line. At least with this particular bowl, they did that. This is all that's left of it, but it was special enough to be kept. Um, and so I thought maybe this is what's happening with the all-white cylinder jars, that they're applying plaster to them and then putting post-firing pigments in brightly colored designs onto them. And then when they're done with whatever type of ritual involved the cylinder jars, they would scrub that plaster and pigment off 
and prepare it for the next time. Um, this would be by analogy with Kiva murals, where Kiva murals are new plaster might be put on the inside of a Kiva, uh, designs put on top of that, and then it is either covered over or wiped clean for the next ritual cycle. Um, so we know that this kind of activity occurred in the Southwest. It just hasn't been applied to the cylinder jars from Chaco before. Um, okay, so basically what the useware and residues tell, told me so far was that there actually was relatively little useware on the cylinder vessels, especially on the inside. Apart from occasionally finding those scratches on the inside from the parrots, um, mostly the interior shows no use wear at all and the exterior mostly shows use wear on the bases and there's not a lot of it. Um, the, I couldn't find any evidence for skins tied to the lugs and I found very few scratches on the interiors as I said. So I, don't, I didn't see evidence that the drum hypothesis was going to work. Sometimes there were, though, these scrubbing marks on the sides. And the presence of plaster suggests that they formerly might have had brightly painted surfaces. <clears throat> so let's move on to the issue of analogy. How were vessels that are similar in shape used in other parts of the New World? Now, cylinder jars do occur in Mesoamerica, especially among the Maya area, or in the Maya area, and in Oaxaca. Um, the dimensions of the classic period Maya cylinder jars, like this one, um, are very, very similar to the cylinder jars from Chaco Canyon. So in terms of dimensions, the basic shape, they're very similar but the Maya ones don't have the lug handles. They tend not to have any kind of handles at all. And obviously they're a little fancier than the Chaco and cylinder jars. Um, more importantly though, the Maya cylinder jars predate the Chaco cylinder jars. Remember the Chaco and cylinder jars date between about 1000 and 1125 or 1150, whereas the Maya classic period cylinder jars um, the, the classic period ends at 900, so they predate Chaco, the Chacoan ones by at least 100 years. Chaco is contemporaneous with the early post-classic in Mesoamerica, which dates between about AD 900 and 1200, but you don't find cylinder jars like this during that time. Furthermore, the cylinder jars found in Chaco were definitely locally made. Um, I base this on looking at the temper, the, the aplastic, the rocks and so on in the, in the paste of the ceramics. These are um, ceramics, other ceramics found in Chaco. This is one of the cylinder jars. You can see that in terms of the basic design and colors and so on, they're identical. So they seem to have been made in the same places that the Choc other Chaco and pottery was. They were not as far as I can tell, made in Mesoamerica. But the idea to make them and the basic proportions may have come from Mesoamerica. This would fit with other items from Mesoamerica, particularly the macaws, those poor macaws, um, which come from the tropical lowlands. There are quite a number of macaws at Pueblo Benito, they are scarlet macaws, and they would have come from the tropical lowlands of Mesoamerica. So it's possible that the idea to make cylinder jars could have come from Mesoamerica, that somebody saw it down there, or uh, uh, somebody drew a picture of it, or something, that the idea traveled from the Maya area into the Chaco area. Um, moreover, the Maya cylinder jars sometimes have plaster on them with brightly colored post-firing pigment. This is the little scraps of plaster up here and at the base, and they are covered with a kind of blue called Maya blue. So that same kind of technology occurs on the Maya cylinder vessels. It's too bad that the timing is so off for them. 
Okay, well, this brings us to serendipity number four, which is I ask a silly question. There were so many similarities with the Maya cylinder jars that I began to wonder, um, I wanted to ask more questions about Maya cylinder vessels. So I called a famous Mayanist who specializes in cylinder vessels named Dory Reince Boudet, and I asked her how the jars there were used, and she said that they were used for drinking cacao, or chocolate drinks. And I said, well, you know, how do you know? Did you have a residue analysis done? And she said, no, it says it on them. <laughs> Which um, I think is cheating. <laughs> um, this, this one has an inscription that says, this is Joe's cacao drinking jar. <laughs> and I, I just don't think that's fair. But we just have more challenges in the Southwest. Um, okay, so they have these inscriptions on them that said that they were used for drinking cacao beverages. But when I was talking to her, she said, well, they, we also have done residue analysis. Uh, there's a guy at Hershey, the chocolate place, who does residue analysis and has found the earliest evidence for cacao in the... In the um, Maya area or in Mesoamerica, he's run a lot of samples for people. Um, and his name is Jeff Hurst. And she gave me his phone number to call. Now, what was going through my mind while she was talking to me about this was, you know, people in Chaco got macaws all the way up from the tropics. While they were bringing those really troublesome birds up, wouldn't it be easy to stuff some cacao beans in your pocket and bring them along? I mean, it just seemed like it'd be so much easier to bring cacao than it would be to bring macaws. And so I thought it was well worth following up on the cacao idea after, after I hung up. And this brings us to serendipity number five, which is there is an Air Force base in Albuquerque. Um, I called Jeff Hurst at Hershey, and I explained to him that I was a professor at the University of New Mexico, and I had this pottery from Chaco Canyon, and I was really interested in whether it might have cacao residues on it. And he said, oh, I was in the Air Force in Albuquerque <laughs> at Kirtland Air Force Base. My daughter was born in New Mexico, and I have been to Chaco Canyon. I would be happy to do this for you. I was stunned. It was just such a, a strange coincidence, but perfect, that he had this connection with New Mexico, he'd been out to Chaco Canyon, and he was willing to, do, to run this for me. Um, the problem was that I didn't have any cylinder jars to run. I had this guy who was willing to run five to ten samples for me, but I didn't have any cylinder jars to run. They weren't going to let me in the museums go in and break their cylinder jars in order to get a sample. It's a destructive analysis, and I needed fragments about the size of a dime to do the analysis, but at the moment I couldn't think of where I was going to get them. Fortunately, I married the right man. <laughs> um, it just happened by coincidence that uh, UNM had been excavating at Pueblo Benito. <laughs> this should have crossed my mind, but UNM had been excavating at Pueblo Benito between 2004 and 2007, uh, reopening trenches that had been put in the trash mound south of Pueblo Benito by Neil Judd in the 1920s. And the purpose of reopening them was not to get cylinder jar fragments. It was actually to look at the stratigraphy in those trench walls to see if there were water control features. Neil Judd had said in his stratigraphic profiles, he'd said that there were channels. But he didn't specify if they were artificial channels like canals or if they were natural channels like the Chaco Wash. And so we had permission from the Park Service, hallelujah, 
to uh, reopen these trenches, the only stipulation was that we, unlike Neil Judd, we needed to screen all of the dirt that came out of the trenches. So Judd had put these trenches through the trash mounds, piled all the dirt up on the side of the trash mound, uh, and then pushed it back in again. And we have pictures that basically show that. He hadn't taken very many artifacts out of it. So we went back in, re-excavated, and screened all of it, and ended up with over 200,000 broken fragments of pottery from Pueblo Benito for analysis. All of this under the supervision of my husband, Chip Wills. So that really worked out well for me. Um, I then had gotten NSF funding to analyze this 200,000 fragments of pottery, and I had nine students working in a lab with me for two years analyzing all the pottery. And along the way, at this point, this point is about um, 2007, at this point we had not found any definite cylinder jar fragments, but we had found a number of what the students and I thought might be cylinder jar fragments like this um, in, the, um, in the assemblage. The problem with cylinder jars is that unless you get the base, which is shaped like an L, what any other part of the pot could be a different form of pottery. Pitchers also have very straight uh, tops and then bulbous bottom. So you really need the base to be absolutely sure it's a cylinder jar, or you need the rim with one of those lugs on it. Um, and we didn't have anything like that at that point. Now we do, but at the point at which I was trying to get my samples together, we didn't. So what I sent in was three of what I thought were probably cylinder jars based on how straight they were um, and the designs and so on one definite pitcher that had a handle attached, so I knew it was a pitcher, and then one sherd that I really wasn't clear which it was. Um, this is one of the sherds. This is sample 2001, which you will see again in a minute. Okay, so here's the Hershey Center analysis. This was done at the Hershey Center for Health and Nutrition. Great name. Um, <laughs> it was a technique called uh, high-performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Uh, it does destroy a small amount of pottery. What you get back is what's called a chromatogram that shows organic compounds. And then you compare the compounds to known foods. This is a chromatogram from SHRD 2001, which is that sample that you saw in the, sli the two slides ago. This is the standard. This is the uh, cacao, rather. And this is the SHRD. And you can see how similar they are. Um, when Jeff called me to tell me this, which was October of 2008, he said he'd never had a sample, uh, an analysis come out so well, looking so good. And this was really a spectacular find for that sure 2001. Um, now, what he was looking for was theobromine, which is what's called a biomarker of cacao. It's an organic compound in, in chocolate or in cacao that is distinctive of cacao, especially in high amounts. With cacao, you get a very high spike of theobromine and a tiny one of caffeine. Yes, there is caffeine in chocolate. Um, with some other plants in the New World, you might get a much higher spike of caffeine and a low one of theobromine, but with cacao, you get this very tall spike of theobromine, which I, I'm pretty sure is this. That's the theobromine on here. Okay. So uh, the results did show the presence of theobromine, which, as I said, is a biomarker of cacao. Um, this is what... Uh, the uh, Theobroma cacao tree looks like, this one. And these pods, when you open them up, have seeds surrounded by this white stuff that apparently is very sweet. Has anybody ever had that, the white stuff? It's supposed to be, and it's very, very sweet and delicious is what I hear, sort of like... Like tooth-hurting sweet? Oh, okay, but... Oh, so good. 
Um, but they don't usually trade this, the white stuff. Instead, it's the cacao beans or nibs that are traded. These are fermented, usually in the white stuff, for a few days, and then they're roasted. And once they're roasted, then they can be pretty easily transported for long distances, even across deserts. It never looks like this. <laughs> that's, that's one of those internet lies. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. It is not true. OK. Um, so the, in, in uh, Mesoamerica, the pods were processed to create several drinks. And, and Theobroma cacao, the tree, actually grows in the tropics of Central America and South America. The pods can be used for several drinks, one made from this white substance that is called tree fresh cacao, and then the other from the seeds, which, as I said, are fermented and roasted. Um, it could not be grown in the U.S., but from Spanish chronicles, we know the distribution, what the distribution of cacao groves looked like um, in 1520. Now, this is a long time after Chaco, but presumably the environment was pretty much the same. So if they could grow cacao there then, they probably could have grown cacao 400 years or 500 years earlier when Chaco was running. So you can see that the, the closest cacao is down about here, which is about 1,200 miles from Chaco Canyon. It's quite, quite a long distance. How was it used in Mesoamerica? Um, well, be beverages of cacao were consumed in Mesoamerica by at least 1,500 B.C., it was used in rituals and especially in rites of passage, weddings, funerals, um, christenings, and so on, up to the present time. Um, the beans, once they're roasted, are ground and then mixed with water and other, other flavorants. And the flavorants that were used historically in Mesoamerica include corn and chili and honey. Um, vanilla where it was available. So different flavorants could be added to make it less bitter than it was otherwise. It was a form of currency among the Aztec. Now the Aztec are much later than Chaco Canyon by several hundred years, but they did use cacao as a form of currency. And in fact, it was such an important form of currency that they actually made counterfeit cacao beans out of clay, <laughs> which seems kind of pitiful to me. Um, an important part of the preparation was frothing, creating the froth on it. And this might have been done in one of several ways. One way was to pour from one cylinder among the Maya. They poured from one cylinder jar to another from a great height. And as it fell, it was a little like a waterfall, and you'd get this froth at the bottom. Another way was that they had special vessels that actually had a... Um, what looked like a spout, but it's much too narrow to act as a spout. It goes down to the bottom of the vessel, and they would blow into it to create bubbles at the top. Um, and another way, uh, perhaps introduced by the Spanish, was to use a stick as a whisk and stir it, and that would create a froth. I've heard from chocolatiers that it's very hard to get a froth on modern chocolate, um, and some of them add a little... Um, agave soap to their chocolate if they want to froth because then they get the nice soap bubbles. It looks very frothy. I don't know. Okay. Um, so uh, this map shows possible routes of getting cacao to Chaco. Basically, if you think about it, if you're getting cacao from 1,200 miles away into Chaco Canyon, Either you have to have people from Chaco walking down to get it, or you have to have people from Mesoamerica walking up to get it, or you have to be passing it hand-to-hand -hand along that 1,200-mile route, or some combination of those things. Now, we know that the Maya, historically, when the Spanish arrived, the Maya had actually uh, trading canoes that went out in the Caribbean that carried cacao, and they were enormous canoes. So it's possible that some of the route to Chaco was done by boat, but I'm thinking probably not all of it. That would probably be a little, a little difficult. Um, so it's possible that some of the 1,200 miles could be covered by boat, uh, and then the rest of it either by hand-to-hand by -hand exchange or uh, 
traders moving in one direction or the other. We know uh, during Aztec times that there was quite an extensive network of traders who had these backpacks and they would travel very far um, carrying Mesoamerican goods, including cacao in these backpacks. It was one of the favorite things that they, that they um, carried in the backpacks for trade. Um, now, a possible piece of evidence that Chacoans might have gone south comes from rock art behind Pueblo Benito. I've seen this rock art for a really long time, and I always thought it was a caterpillar because it's got these little antennae at the top. But a, a um, clever ranger out there noticed that this rock art, which is right behind Pueblo Benito, resembles the cacao tree on this Maya cylinder vessel and the cacao tree on this Maya um, stone sculpture. And so she suggested to me and sent me this slide, it was very nice of her, that this might um, represent a cacao tree. I, it might also be a caterpillar. <laughs> I, I don't know one way or another, but she suggested that maybe Chacoans were going south and then came back and drew this really lovely petroglyph of a cacao tree behind Pueblo Benito. So why would they import cacao from such a great distance? Well, one possibility is the nutritional value. Um, in fact, chocolate, yes, I've been arguing this to my family for years. I have to eat this chocolate, it's really nutritious. But in fact, it is incredibly nutritious, especially if you're not getting a lot of proteins from other sources. So it has a very high amount of fat, that's the downside, high in carbohydrates, high in fiber, pretty good proteins, all of these minerals, vitamins. It's really a nutritious food. Um, and yes, that's the most important point of this talk, is that chocolate is good for you. Um, uh, okay, so it does have nutritional value. Another possibility is the pharmacological effects of eating chocolate. The, both the theobromine and the caffeine are mild stimulants that would enhance any experience um, that was going on while you were consuming them. So if you go to a ritual, you go to a feast and you have a big jar of cacao, you would probably enjoy that a lot more than you would otherwise. Uh, another possibility is um, there are a number of medicinal uses around the world. Um, Apparently, it's really good for coughs. So the next time you have a cough, have some chocolate because it's really supposed to calm coughs, which is something that I didn't know. So it has all of these po possible medicinal uses as well as the nutritional, nutritional and pharmacological uses. Um, however, I want to stress that at this point, while we know that cacao would have been an excellent dietary staple in Chaco Canyon, corn and chocolate every day of the week um, and a valuable medicinal plant, there is no evidence at the present time that it was available in sufficient quantities to really serve as an important part of the Southwestern diet. Instead, I think that it's what anthropologists call a luxury food. Luxury food, according to anthropologists, are foods that are difficult to obtain um, they often signal a message of distance. They're related somehow to something very distant. Caviar is a really good example in our own society. Uh, they indicate the power to acquire exotic foreign foods and would have indicated probably a tie with Mesoamerica. People would have known that this was an exotic food from far away. Um, they necessitate very special preparation generally and the, they enhance the occasions in which they're served. Now, luxury foods in fairly simple societies usually are versions of the same old foods they eat every day but fixed in a really elaborate way. Luxury foods in more complex societies are like this. They're obtained from a distance. They're very labor intensive to get, to prepare, and sometimes to consume. Um, and caviar is a really good example in our own culture. So what are the implications of all of this? Well, 
It appears that cacao was exchanged along with macaws from the tropical areas of Mesoamerica to Chaco by AD 1000. The 1200 mile trip probably took less than six months um, and this, this figure is based on uh, assuming that the cacao came with the macaws since they're coming from the same environment and the macaws are taking no more than six months to get to Chaco. Uh, cylinder jars were probably, I think, used for drinking cacao beverages as luxury foods in rituals or feasts. Their recovery in caches suggests that these rituals involve the well-being of the community rather than the well-being of any single individuals. Um, they may have been used for feasting, for entertaining elites, for gaining loyalty and labor. We don't really know. I'd do almost anything for chocolate, so. <laughs> I'd build a great house for chocolate. Um, and the ability to acquire and serve cacao drinks may have been important for men's status, while it's likely that the knowledge of how to prepare cacao drinks may have been more important for women's status. And w I, we're welcome to argue about that later. So where are we with this? Um, I've just obtained NSF funding to expand this study and run about 300 samples from around the Southwest and I'm expanding it both temporally and spatially. So I'm looking at earlier time periods within Chaco, later time periods within Chaco as they went from cylinder jars to mugs, mugs of cocoa, what could be better? Um, and then moving out from Chaco into other areas. Uh, tomorrow I'll be at the Arizona State Museum, hopefully getting some samples of Ho'okam pottery to run as well. I'll be looking at material from the Mimbris area and hopefully from northern uh, Chihuahua as well. So I want to expand the study. I want to include a much greater geographic area, as I said, and I want to eat a lot more chocolate. <laughs> so thank you very much.